Like you, yeah. you're not just going to show up to something like that, get super stressed out, get all these adrenaline dumps, like cortisol dumps in your body. Yeah. And you're just going to make all these crazy critical decisions on the fly. And the training that we were getting to be able to get yourself through a situation like that. Like I can't think of a time that I was ever trained or it had ever been talked about uh, managing stress. But the crazy thing is, is like at a, at a drop of a hat as a cop, dude, you may be getting dispatched to that call. And Absolutely. now, now you're expected to, to fucking handle that call. The, the Uvalde yeah. call, right? Yeah. It, it just fucking blows my mind that, and I still don't get it um, because it still doesn't seem like, like we invest a whole lot of time into it is, is managing stress and and how your brain actually operates. I I don't think there's one hour spent in the academy learning that. Well, how many times did you train for a situation similar to the one you were in before you were in that situation? Honest to God, I had been a cop for probably 10 years at that point, a a handful, handful. maybe a handful. Did you ever feel that stress? No, not even close. So that's, that's what we do really well, specifically at, at development group is we are able to recreate the stress of war in training. And I tell people the first time you are stressed out to that point where you make those kinds of mistakes shouldn't be on a real target. No, I can look at the AAR from Uvalde and I, I would say 75 to 80% of the things that they had go wrong could have been um, fixed on a training evolution. One training day, like we could have recreated a lot of that stuff and fixed the problems before they happened in a real world situation. And that just comes with getting out of your comfort zone in training, right? Yeah. It's, it's really hard for law enforcement to train themselves on critical incident response because there's so few critical incidents that happen throughout a career. And, you know, that's why I recommend bringing in people like me, you know, mm-hmm. obviously not just nonprofit, but there's for-profit companies that do this. Um, if you can afford that, because these are people who did it for 20 years, sustained combat every night going out and being in active shooter situations or barricaded shooter, or, you know, generally just people wanting to kill you just because you're, you know, who you are. Yeah. So it's this vast wealth of knowledge of guys who now that the wars are are over for the most part and we're not being utilized or getting out and have this amazing abundance of knowledge and mindset on handling stress and leadership development and training and and how to uh, critique and after action and just want to give that knowledge to somebody else. Right. And it, to me, man, you get to me, law enforcement should be knocking down their door trying to get those guys in. Agreed. Totally. It, I agree. What <clears throat> imagine if, if that was the standard across the nation for cops, imagine the amount of cops that would less likely be killed. This is the perfect time. If you're looking to improve your tactics while responding to critical incidents and in progress crimes, go to the savage training group.com, click on the online courses and register for the response tactics for critical incidents and in progress crimes course. Whether it's an armed barricaded situation, coordinating containment, or pursuing a fleeing suspect, this online self-paced course will help give you the needed tactics to handle critical incidents and in-progress crimes. To receive a discount, click the link in the description below and use the promo code. Probably citizens that that are or cops that are involved in shootings where they're, yeah. you know, that probably shouldn't have been. Those types of situations would happen far less and we would have yeah. so much less controversy with cops right? And over these controversial shootings, if they were properly trained to be able to show up and properly manage a situation like that. Probably manage, but just how to handle stress. Or, or, or yeah, if manage you stress. Talk about the lowest common denominator is giving someone the fundamental ability to be able to handle stressful situations and still work through it. I use skydiving as an example. If you've jumped out of a plane before. No. No. Well, no. anybody that has, right? The first jump you do, all you see is toilet paper tubes at the ground <laughs> yeah. like, and you're waiting for the ground to come up and get you. Yeah. By the, you know, 10th jump, it's like, oh, all right, I see trees. I see there's other skydivers. And then 100 jumps, you see everything. And you're out there and you're, you're flipping and doing all this crazy stuff. And then the more you do, the more comfortable you get being in a situation in which you could die. It's the same thing with tactics and CQB, man. You have to work in that environment to be better handling the stress that that environment puts on you. And if you don't train for it, there's no way it's going to happen. Yeah. Is there a way or something you could offer just... W- w- just a short something that cops could do right now in their patrol car or their patrol teams, just a, just a, a something about managing stress. Like how would you, with the exception of bringing in a team to, to help and seek actual training, is there something that you could provide? Uh, it, so here, here's the thing I tell everybody, whenever we go to a range, I know who practices and who doesn't practice. Yeah. You know, I can look at people's form, how they stand, right? They, you know, I'm a better shot if I come up and I have this really, you know, 
equal distance stance and my arms are out and I'm going to, but you're never going to do that in a tactical environment. Right. And we're training in law enforcement, not to take rain shots. We're training in case we actually have to utilize our weapons. So there's, there's ways officers can better skills when it comes to firearms, um, manipulation, um, transitioning things that could happen that you shouldn't have to worry about on target that you can work through without having any tactical training whatsoever. And you can dry fire at home and I'll, I'll caveat, hey, dry fire, clear and safe your weapon before you do this. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, how easy is it to watch a YouTube video? And there's plenty of guys that are putting stuff out. That's pretty good. If you you know need help finding the right ones, let me know where you just work on transitioning from pistol to rifle without a weapon, just working out the kinks in your gear. Like, is my retention good? Is it not? Do I have access to my mags? You know, is this something that I could do under stress? What if I get shot in the arm and I need to do a mag change? Right. There's, there's so many things that we don't think about that you could do on your own time at home, 15 minutes a day that are going to make you better. Cause now that's one less thing you have to worry about on target. So there's always stuff you can do. Yeah. And the cops that want to get better are going to do that. Yeah. There's just so many cops out there that just don't want to put in the work. They want to show up. They want to put in the 10 hours. They want to collect the paycheck. Right. And I, I mean, that, that's, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how to change someone's perspective of that, but well, I mean, I'll play the devil's advocate here because I've seen this in my community. When you're working 80 hours a week because you're working overtime to make your living, it's awful hard to ask people to then to go put in training on their own time, right? For sure. Because quality of life is huge. Yeah. You need to have that 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 break, that family time to, to be a, a, a functioning member of a unit. And if yeah. you take that away because you want them to go do jujitsu or go to the range on their own time, and then you're cutting into the quality of life and morale goes down when morale goes down, effort goes down. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm not saying the people you're talking about don't exist. They absolutely do. They exist in the SEAL community, any community, right? <clears throat> um, yeah. But there's a lot of people that if they're given more of an opportunity to train in the workplace, vice at home, they would probably put more effort at home as well as in the workplace. Yeah, it's interesting you bring that up because I look back when I was a cop and those that did their 40 hours, Yep. didn't seek any other training were some of the, the mentally healthiest people <laughs> right? because quality of life of being at home yeah. was super important and they were the bare minimum. But I, I look at that and I go, ah, you're pretty smart that way, but also you're, right. you're lacking others. So I really like your idea of three weeks, you work whatever your shift is, then a week of training. Yeah. Like that's how you do it. You need it. The departments need to yeah, start balancing that and it, saying, it, you know, it's more this. money, but Hey, there's money out there. We all know there's money out there. It's just, what are we putting that we putting it to nods when we're doing all daytime stuff? I don't know. It, it's how do we spend our money wisely? And it's how do we advocate for change? You know, and I hate bringing up change because it, you know, it, it's what people have been screaming for, you know, defund the police and, and no, let's figure out a better way to allocate money so that yeah. the, the, the stuff yeah. is going right. And we're, it, we all want the same result. We all want safe communities. We want our officers to be safe. We want our families to be safe. Let's figure out a better way to do that. Well, you know, um, Sheriff Lamb talks about that and talks about running a police department like a business Yeah, and running not a deficit. And then you, but police departments are not run like businesses No, and they don't, manage money and they buy things and like, Oh, we yeah. have this, yeah, well, we got to sell, you know, like it's antiquated. It's, so is the military, right? The military yeah. style, you know, leadership we have is very antiquated in, in promoting and, and all that stuff. But law enforcement's the same way. Yeah. It doesn't evolve. It's the, it yeah. seems to be the only thing that doesn't evolve. It, no business out there. If they don't evolve, they don't survive. Correct. Yeah. And you know, the environment around you guys is evolving. Totally. It's up to you to evolve with it or get yeah. left behind. Right. And, and you know, I, like I said, we're advocates as much as we are trying to help. So what's your company called? So my company is Community First Project. Uh, that's my nonprofit. Uh, C1P.org is my website. If anybody wants more information or wants to reach out, you can do it through the website. Um, and like I said, I'll talk to anybody at any time. I, you know, to me, it's important to get the message out. It's important to help as much as I can help, whether that's in person or just jumping on a Zoom call and talking through some some sticking points maybe in the training. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm always available. And are you physically coming out and doing the training yourself or you sent, or are there other people going? I mean, it's, it's both. Um, I, I, I like to do that stuff. You know, to me, it's, it's kind of like being around the boys and, and, you know, kind of hold on to my past a little bit, but yeah. I love to train and I love to teach. And that's kind of why I started doing this, but I spend a lot of time fundraising and, and trying to network and get the, the word out. Cause at the end of the day, I can only train as many cops as I have money to do it. And I, I need to always find sources of revenue. So, so how can people donate? You can donate on the website. 
Um, it's easy. Every little bit helps and it's all tax write-offs. So whatever you donate is, is, is we are a 501 C three, you can write it off. Um, we're big, making a big push now for corporate sponsorship. So if anybody's listening that has companies that want to get involved, you know, it, it, we, we look at some of the large block uh, box stores, right? Places where these incidents are going down, they should be willing to invest in, in community safety, right? It's a totally. direct benefit to them. Yeah. So any ins to those networks, um, you know, think about like movie theaters, grocery stores, Walmart, Target, all these places where things are happening repeatedly, then yeah, let's, let's chat and see if we can figure out a way that's, you know, we're helping them and we're helping the communities. Mm. Um, and, and obviously grant money trying to attack that grant market, which is hard because it tends to go to the same people every year. Yeah. And, and uh, there's a, that's a big market. It is. It's a ton of money and we're a relatively new nonprofit with less than a year old. So it's really hard to make a case to justify, um, us just because we don't have the track record yet that some of these bigger companies who've been around for 10 years have. And, and, you know, like alert that's tied into the, the school system in Texas. Right. So they're doing a lot of good things down there. So if a, if a department um, gets together and they want to hire you guys to come out, I mean, you're, you're still funding and, and hiring tier one operators to come out and provide the the level of training yeah, for these guys. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. So I'll pay for it. I, mean, I do for-profit training too. So any, you know, government agencies, SWAT teams, and even some departments, if they have grant money, they get a budget and they want us to come in on the for-profit side, we'll do that too. Um, and what I tell them is whatever the profit is, we'll split it between the for-profit and the non-profit. So if a, a SWAT team, big city SWAT team wants us to come in, they're also going to fund training for a smaller department because part of that money is going into the nonprofit. Um, same with the government agencies. And, you know, we'll, we'll even do threat um, analysis for companies. You know, um, there's been some concert venues that have brought us in to come in and, and train their people on active shooter response. What happens if somebody comes into their venue? Um, so there's a lot of stuff we can do. I hate to say no. And I have this extensive knowledge. And if I don't have the knowledge, I've got the guys that do anywhere from drones to dogs to, to whatever, right? Because it's everything we've ever taken on target. We have the ability to teach from the best people that have done it because that's how we learned. So it, it, it's, you know, we're, we're trying to grow, we're trying to scale, and we want to be able to answer any problem that you guys have. That's our goal. Man. Well, man, I, I like, seriously, I, I really appreciate what you're doing. Um, I, I agree with you that not enough of guys with your talent um, we, we don't, we don't seek that out in the law enforcement community, uh, and we should. Yeah. So I think even this is a good resource for guys. There's a ton of guys that are going to watch this. I know a lot of you are yeah. watching this, hit dude, up. hit them, hit yep. solely up. Can they find you on Instagram? Do you have an Instagram? Social yeah. Media? Community underscore first underscore project. Um, also if you go to the C1P.org website, there's a link to my Instagram. You